Well, thank you very much, Reza, for that uh, generous introduction. And uh, thank you, Leslie, for the invitation. Um, it's a real honor and a real privilege to be here and uh, particularly to uh, speak to architects and engineers together. Um, this is what our practice has been all about for the last uh, 25 or 27 years. And, uh, and we've had many, many enjoyable experiences along the way. Um, it's not the easiest profession, structural engineering. Uh, neither is architecture, of course, but uh, it's made a lot more enjoyable when you get to work with some of the best architects that are in this province. And uh, I don't say that so lightly. And uh, just before I get on to that a little bit further, um, congratulations to Austin and Brandon, okay? Don't want to forget that. <laughs> Back to the architects. Um, it's, uh, I, I really, uh, we're, we're beginning, uh, we're getting more and more involved in uh, international circles and with uh, international architects. Uh, most recently with uh, um, BIG, Bjarke Engels Group, and uh, ZGF down the U.S. and others as well. And uh, I, can, I can honestly say in my travels, and we have the office in Frankfurt now too, that, uh, that we have some of the best architects um, here, right here in our city. And recently I think it was uh, just announced that, um, that Michael Dane from Polygon is going to have this museum built to house his art collection over in Whistler. And uh, I read that capture, the, the quote in the newspaper that uh, he said, uh, he said no to any sort of international competition. He says, we have enough good BC architects to get the job done. And I thought that was fantastic. And it, it, it is really true that uh, there's, um, there's great architects that work with here. We've had fantastic experiences uh, with many of you. And uh, we continue to look forward to many more experiences. And uh, when it comes to the subject of exposed structure, it's really all about integrating um, structure and architecture. And not just structure and, the structure and architecture, but also the other disciplines. And uh, I think you'll gather from my talk tonight that um, the, the, the direction that we're heading in is a practice too, and, and that the, I think the industry will more and more head in as well. Um, just uh, trying to integrate the disciplines more and more and more. And rather just the structure being there to hold up the, the loads in the building and uh, to you know, support the snow loads and that. Uh, it's going to do more and more functions. It'll become more, it'll be, become a multitasker, if you like. And I want to show you some examples of that today. So um, it's been a real joy to uh, to, to work with many of you, and uh, and today I just want to share with you some of the experiences that we've gone through. But I want to actually begin by looking back at uh, examples that we have in nature, um, exposed structure or, or non-exposed structure in nature. What does nature tell us? about exposed versus non-exposed structure is often the question. Well, do we cover up, like in this room here, the structure is virtually all covered up. The walls and the ceiling is covered up. Um, and uh, in other buildings and other uh, um, uh, structures, uh, you actually see the structure. So uh, I begin to ask myself the question, even in preparing this lecture here, like when is it actually appropriate, right at the foundational level, when is it appropriate to express the structure and when not? And trying to find some clues to that and so I thought, well, why not turn to nature once too and see what does nature tell us in this direction, if anything? And uh, then also look at some historic structures going back to two and a half thousand years before Christ and just see what type of, you know, messages we get out of historic structures in regard to the subject. And finally, just look at some of our own, our own projects and, uh, and lessons that we have learned. And I've called it possibilities and pitfalls. And, and believe me, we've, uh, we've burnt our finger on a lot of different uh, uh, projects where we had to learn the lessons the hard way. And on the other hand, uh, we've also discovered lots of possibilities and potential that exposed structure offers up. So uh, without uh, you know, any further ado, let's get right into the subject matter. And uh, if we're talking about structural engineering, and uh, of course we're talking about uh, the forces of nature, and we're talking about equilibrium, and uh, here is just a, a, a raw example of exposed structure as shaped by the forces of nature, be it wind, be it water, uh, be it the temperature effects, um, just a, a, a grand example of uh, structure in its rawest form. And there's an inherent beauty just to even looking at this balanced rock, which uh, I think this one is in, in Utah, right? And there's uh, some other balanced rocks too, but this seems to be, in my view, at least the most dramatic one. Um, just something beautiful, to be, something beautiful to behold in nature. No need to cover it up, and so it's just there as nature has formed it. Um, the Slot Canyon. I believe also in, in Utah. And just when you look at this geological formation, how it's shaped by, by water and by wind and uh, uh, by temperature as well, of course, uh, what, what, a, what a marvelous example of just raw, exposed structure. 
Um, yeah, it's more than it needs to be probably to hold things up, but it's just a beautiful example of, uh, you know, and, and with the right lighting, of course, too, it's just a, it's just a thing to behold, a, a beautiful uh, piece of express structure. Um, the stone bridge here also in, in Utah, and uh, this isn't the only one that, is, that exists, but uh, just another example of uh, just how, how the force of nature forms something and you're just left with raw structure, no need to cover it up. Now there may be, of course, some plants growing on the top there, and of course it can serve as an animal crossing and that, but uh, pedestrian crossing too, but um, it really is just a raw structure expressed there in nature. Here, uh, you know, the, the effect particularly of water and, and ice and, 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 and cold temperatures and uh, just forming this natural ice bridge. Um, no reason to cover this up with anything else. It's just raw, beautiful uh, structure. Um, when we move into the plant world, um, if you take a leaf, for instance, and you just see this, um, this central spine, and perhaps I'll just pull up my, um, my pointer here so we can... Just, we just observe the central spine here and how these tributaries flow off of it. Um, structural spine with some lighter structural tributary arms coming off of it. And in between, it's almost like infill panels, but even some more randomly directioned ribbing in between to give it a little bit more strength and, and, and structural support. Um, just a, a wonderful example, even how, how seamlessly the, these tributary um, um, elements flow into the central spine here. Uh, and meld into it. Just uh, this is what nature offers up and, and gives us and lets us become inspired by. And uh, it's been on more than one occasion where I've actually walked outside the office when we're talking with the architect, particularly one project in Malaysia once where they, we wanted to design a canopy and I just picked a, a leaf off of the tree outside and brought it into the room and said, well, you know, here's actually a very natural form that is structurally stable and, and, and beautiful and why don't we consider uh, letting this inspire us as we design this canopy which is over a rapid transit station. Um, there you see it up close, and once again, just how these um, tributary elements just meld into the central spine. Just, just a wonderful example of, of uh, how nature um, can inspire us uh, with beautiful structure and exposed structure. Well, here's another uh, case, the, the, uh, the tree, of course. And uh, you know, there is the tree in the wintertime in its raw, exposed form. You see the entire structure. Okay, you could argue that's got a thick coat of paint or if you like the bark on it, right? And so it's not 100% exposed, but for all intents and purposes, you see the structural element in its full glory. And yet in the summertime, or in the, in the springtime, um, it, it, it of course uh, takes on foliage. In the summertime, the colors change slightly, and of course in the fall, you get this wonderful display of different colors. And then wintertime is just raw structure again. So here's a case of exposed structure, which turns to non-exposed structure for three seasons, and then back to exposed structure again. What's the message coming out of that? Well, um, <laughs> there's no hard and fast rule when to expose structure and when not to expose structure. Um, nature has obviously chosen to, uh, to, to um, you know, reveal it in such and such a way that, that, um, that th there's a purpose for why this foliage you know, comes in the tree. It offers shade, of course. Uh, probably draw, helps draw nutrients out of the ground and into the tree and helps it to grow. Uh, and I'm sure as you delve into it further, there's all sorts of functions that that foliage has but it basically serves to also cover the structure and you don't see it anymore. So uh, an interesting example of um, in nature. Now I'm here just the uh, coniferous trees, uh, evergreen trees, um, and uh, if you call the needles uh, um, you know, non-structural components, well, they year round, they actually cover up the structure. And so you don't have just pure exposed structure here. And uh, of course, we as humans, then we take these trees at Christmas time and uh, well, if my home where I grew up was an example. Uh, like, you didn't see a whole lot of tree anymore, you just saw a whole bunch of tinsel on there. <laughs> and so uh, it's amazing actually when you think about it that uh, growing up in a family where the tinsel covered most of the tree, that uh, it would produce an engineer that has a love for exposed structure <laughs> because uh, it certainly was going the opposite direction at home. But nevertheless, there's a, another case of uh, in nature. Here's uh, what's called the dragon blood tree. Um, have any of you ever seen one of these trees? They actually grow in Yemen. And uh, interestingly, here you see the structure, the, 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 the main, um, the, the main uh, stem, if you like. Or, and um, then up here, you see the other branches coming off. And of course, there's a bit of a lid on top here, right? You see this covering. It's almost like a structural, uh, like a canopy that has a roof membrane on top. And uh, the structure is exposed underneath. 
and on top it's all covered up, likely to protect against the heat here. Otherwise, uh, that tree may, want, will, may will not survive. So uh, nature, once again, has its reasons why it is uh, doing certain things. In this case, it's basically par partially covered, and the bottom here is uh, all exposed. Um, the mushroom, another example, bit of a, call it a, a hat or a lid or a cover on top or a membrane on top, and I'm sure these are very sensitive to sunlight and to heat. All these, uh, the, the, these narrow, thin little um, projecting, uh, um, call them filaments or call them, um, yeah, just extensions there off the main stem. And uh, once again, partially exposed structure underneath here, but covered on top. So what's the main message coming out of all this? Um, well, there's, there's no hard and fast rule in nature pointing one direction or the other. It has to be exposed structure, as much as the structure engineer likes to head in that direction. Um, but uh, here's a bee's nest. Uh, once again, a very light cover on the outside and inside this beautiful honeycomb structure, um, you know, based on a, um, on a hexagon here. And just looking at it a little bit more closely, um, you know, how often have we used hexagons to actually create interesting structure? It's such a stable structural form, particularly also in geodesic domes, including the science world, which is a hexagon there. And um, just uh, to think that bees just somehow construct this beautiful structure. And, uh, and, and, and we spend, uh, you know, hours and days and months and years trying to emulate something like that uh, in, in the constructing the built environment. So um, here, uh, <laughs> just now into the animal world and uh, like don't let the eyes of this owl um, spook you too much. I mean, I, I found these penetrating eyes more penetrating than the Mona Lisa even. Mm -hmm. um, but there you see once again this exposed the, it, it's on one hand covered structure, but you see the, 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 um, the signs of the structure within the body of this owl, um, you know, covered with plumage here, of course, and, and here with other soft tissues and uh, ligaments and everything. And so this is, uh, in the animal world, you see a lot of everything, pretty well everything's covered and uh, not exposed. And finally, or uh, not quite at the end here, um, not to focus so much on the spider, but uh, what a beautiful structure expression here, the spider web. And to think that this is spun in a, in a few hours' time while we're sleeping. And uh, just amazing, just amazing when you look at it. And if you look at it closer up, you see these filaments here. And just, just marvelous. And, uh, and uh, you know, these are the things we dream of as architects and engineers, right? Trying to create beautiful structure. And here it is right in nature being spun by a simple spider. So another example um, of, uh, once again, completely exposed structure on the spider web itself. And finally, if you take the, uh, the crowning jewel of uh, all the created world around us here, there's the uh, human body. And of course, at the, at the heart of it, or the core of it, if you like, is this, uh, is this you know, incredibly intricate structural form. And uh, yet, it's all covered up. It's not really exposed. And uh, you know, for all sorts of different purposes. There's tissue on here, of course. There's ligaments, and there's organs inside. And uh, you know, not the least of which is just to create a much more beautiful aesthetic expression. Um, I wonder how, what it would be like if we were all human beings just walking on skeletons, if we'd still have an appreciation for handsome or for attractive, right? But uh, there you have it in the, um, you know, the, the expression of the human body. You, you see the structural form, the outline of it. And of course, for those of us that uh, don't, don't like to eat very much, you're going to have more structural expression. And if you, eat, <laughs> if you eat too much, you're not going to see any structure. And that's probably the reason why most structural engineers are quite fit, because they want to... <laughs> show their six pack or their eight pack in here. But uh, having, needless to say, um, there is sort of the, uh, the cr crowning jewel of the, uh, you know, the, the, the natural order all around us. And, uh, and, and I find it, um, wh what's the lesson to learn? Um, well, first, there is no hard and fast rule when should structure be exposed or when shouldn't it be exposed. It ultimately has to have a functional purpose. On the human body, clearly it has a functional purpose, not the least of which is to make us more, uh, more handsome and more attractive, right? But also all sorts of other functions. So that's the primary driver as, as we're trying to derive lessons here. Um, I think it's good to remember, if you're going to expose structure or not expose it, let, let, let it be driven by functional reasoning. Um, and and, and, uh, and it, it's a good, good guideline. And other than that, I just find like all these examples of nature um, that just, uh, I, I, I have to confess that I have no difficulty believing that there's just a really creative designer that's behind all of this that we see all around us. And that's inspiring to, to think that we can maybe even just scratch the surface of some of these inspiring forms and, and, and enjoy designing and, uh, and, and expressing structure. It's a, it's a fantastic opportunity that we have as architects and engineers. Um, 
Let's go back two and a half thousand years uh, before Christ, and that would be, um, here's an example of the pyramids. What I discovered actually in my, my research was that these pyramids were actually at one time non-exposed structure. Like right now, all we see is exposed structure. Apparently, there's still some casing stones around the bases of some of these pyramids, but uh, originally they were covered with casing stones. So they did actually cover up the structure. For what purpose, I don't know. But what you're left with now after years of, of course, wind erosion and sand erosion um, and, and temperature effects is that you just have raw exposed structure. And, and even this is a, a, a grand expression of uh, you know, what, 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 uh, what exposed structure can, uh, can do for us and how it can inspire us. Um, about uh, the year 800, I think, it was when King Solomon's temple was built. And um, interestingly, um, in this case here, there is lots of cedar beams and lots of cypress beams and, of course, stone from the quarries. Um, I, I read that actually uh, they, they used 80,000 people just to carve out the stone of the quarries. 80,000, like what a menial job. Um, but nevertheless, um, when it, it was all brought here to Jerusalem, which was a Jewish place of worship back in those times. And uh, most of this here, when you read the account, was all covered up with gold. And so there was a functional purpose for it because they wanted to express the purity and the holiness of God in their worship and want to really create the very best for the place where they're going to worship. And, uh, and, and so hence, most of the structure was actually covered up. You know, there's some stone columns here, I think, that are exposed. But uh, most of it was actually covered with gold. The walls and, uh, and the, um, the floor structure had some gold covering on it too. And um, the beams were covered with gold, it says. So um, that was uh, in the year 800. And if we uh, move, I think, I guess the Parthenon was, uh, you know, a couple hundred years, three, three, four hundred years, I think, uh, BC. And uh, all sorts of exposed columns, just a beautiful, grand expression, again, of, uh, of, of, of raw structure, yeah? There's some uh, elements up here which are not necessarily structurally required, but there you see the big lintels and some straps across there and, the, and these uh, capitals here and then the stone uh, columns coming down here and uh, of course hours of labor to create this beautiful expression. And the Colosseum built around I think uh, 70, 70, 80 um, and once again mostly structural expression here. There's some infill panels here as well. Part of it I understand was destroyed in an earthquake but just a large example of a um, or an example of a very large um, exposed structure. Then moving into uh, the 11, 1200s uh, we all know this building here and these flying buttresses at Notre Dame and uh, these masonry buttresses, exposed structure here, just so you can see exactly how the thrust is being taken out by, these, uh, by the big dome and by the big arches here. And uh, yet there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, architectural uh, elements here too and uh, non-structural components which of course, uh, you know, add to the architectural expression of the entire um, church facility. This is one of the most ex amazing examples of, uh, of uh, structural architectural expression as well, or structural artistic expression. Um, because it, nowadays, if you tried to build this according to the BC Building Code, uh, you, you couldn't build it. From a seismic point of view, this thing would be like, uh, it, it, it would be the first to go over, I think. Um, and, but you just have these ribs here um, that, that, that uh, emanate from the central ring, and there's beautiful glass, stained glass panels in between. Um, just a, a fabulous example of, uh, of, of exposed structure with uh, this beautiful artwork, these uh, stainless st steel, uh, uh, stained glass uh, panels in between. So that's coming through the 11, 1200s. Then if we jump another 800 years forward um, to the Eiffel Tower, another uh, you know, fabulous example of exposed structure. Uh, not 100% just exposed, like there you see the main trusses. Uh, which are actually square in, 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 in cross-section. There's the main trusses coming and melding together here into beautiful peaked form. And there you see some additional architectural elements here, which I don't think were probably intended originally as, uh, as, as you know, actually uh, helping it to withstand the wind loads. And uh, probably a little bit extra in here too, although you do need a bit of a header across here. So that's partly structural in there too. So uh, just a fabulous example for, was it the 19, late 19, 1800s, right, for the World's Fair? Um, built by a, by a master builder, not just a structural engineer, but also someone that um, understood architecture and uh, understood the building process. There you see it a bit closer up with some of the, what I think are more like architectural elements here. And then, uh, well, uh, Gaudi, right? Here's a, another project that ran out of budget and they're still building 200 years later. 
started uh, in the late 1800s, and I think they're anticipating completion sometime in the year 2026 20, now or something. And uh, you know, just a um, another form of uh, architectural structural expression. And there's of course the House of uh, Bones, I believe they call it, in Barcelona. And uh, you know, very organic form here, and strong emphasis on the structural expression uh, to form uh, the, the architectural expression. And at about the same time, the 1900s, one of my favorite pictures, in fact, this picture here, this photo hangs on the wall of my office because I find it in its simplicity so inspiring. And this is north of uh, New Hazelton, BC, um, not far from Smithers. And uh, the Gitzkan um, constructed this bridge sometime, I think it was in the late 1800s. And all they had at their disposal to get across this canyon were logs. And, and stone rubble, I presume, too. And so what they did here was they took these logs here and uh, cut the logs, you know, some trees down, stripped them of their branches, cantilevered out the big logs here over the sides of the canyon and out this side here, too. And then in between, they hung some smaller logs, some lighter logs, tied them all together with vines, and formed this simple bridge structure. Exposed structure in a completely different direction. Nothing else covering it up. Um, and, and just relying on the agility of the users to get across here. Um, just, just a fabulous example. They call this the graceful spider web. And so um, just a fabulous example of, uh, you, know, you know, compare that with Gaudi's work, uh, much more sophisticated, of course, and complex and complicated. And here are these people who had very few tools at their disposal, constructing something that's elegant in its own way, the graceful spider web. Um, well, if we get to... Uh, uh, Another uh, Italian, in this case an engineer, Gaudi was I think an architect and then uh, Nervi of course was an engineer and you can see there was a more technical rigor to uh, what he designed and, uh, and, and just another beautiful example of uh, uh, concrete work in the early 20th century and we just look at this here. Um, I wish labor was as inexpensive nowadays as it was back then <laughs> because just what they did was just amazing, yeah? amazing. Like we, I'm going to show up uh, a slide later on of uh, of the uh, Jasper Library, which we're doing at HCMA Architects up in Edmonton. And it's got a, uh, a, a folded, curvaceous folded roof structure as well. And just the, the, the work we had to go through to get that built and, and, and the concrete uh, work that came out of there, um, it was a big challenge. And yet when I look at what was done like in the early 20th century, just phenomenal. Um, but beautiful example. Another example of his here, the Turin Expo Ex Exhibition Hall. Um, just just beautiful concrete work and beautiful expression, yeah? And uh, no, no other cover here, no drywall covering it up. And then at the other extreme, once you know something a bit smaller, there's uh, um, you know, Mies van der Rohe's uh, 1929 uh, pavilion, or pavilion for the 1929 Barcelona uh, Fair. Uh, and um, here you see also just you know, simple structural expression. At the same time, there's also some marble walls in here and uh, you know, glass, of course. And so just a very simple structural expression. Not all exposed, but much of it exposed. Um, and then uh, look at my art's work. Just a beautiful example of the flow of forces just coming down here. And if you've seen and visited some of these bridges and look at the detailing, particularly at these support points here in the hinges, like the meticulous attention he paid to detail to express the, the, the flow of forces, you know, hinges. That you, one bridge we visited had a beautiful hinge right down here and even cut into the concrete here some, some, some reveals to make sure that the hinging occurred at the right place. Just marvelous. And he, of course, experimented with concrete and tried to create more and more beautiful forms. And so just you, this is really an advancement in, uh, in, in the whole uh, field of exposed structure, uh, just something beautiful. About the same time, uh, they're building the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, and also uh, a, a fabulous example of um, something that's become, uh, of course, a major tourist attraction just by virtue of its uh, uh, architectural, structural expression. And then, of course, uh, what happened in Paris in uh, was it the late 1970s when, uh, when uh, the likes of Richard Rogers and um, I guess it was Renzo Piano uh, submitted this design for this competition, and uh, to everybody's amazement and probably shock, most uh, Parisians were probably shocked that they selected this as the winning entry. And it was like structure came out, right? And here we are, and uh, it was just uh, this uh, 
there's this bold expression all of a sudden of, uh, of, of, of exposed structure, which uh, the Parisians had probably never seen before, um, and uh, that the world had never seen before. And uh, just, just phenomenal what, what actually uh, was constructed here. And uh, what, when we visited this many years ago, 1994, Jerry and I took a trip to Europe to look at all sorts of exposed structure and gain some inspiration. And uh, this is one of the most visited tourist attractions. Like, it would have been heavily critiqued back when it was first constructed, but it is now one of the most visited tourist attractions. So somehow this, this exposed structure, you can like it or you can hate it, but it just draws people and makes them want to see it. And of course, here's all these uh, mechanical installations as well. And uh, here's the big, um, what they call the Gerberets, these huge cast iron pieces, which was a really bold move by the structural engineers to actually pull it off. And there were some real issues that came up when they were actually fabricating these things, manufacturing them. But they got through all that and, uh, and just a real bold statement of uh, what you can do with structure. So um, there's uh, <laughs> the invasion of Paris, if you like to call that, with uh, Boberg in the 1970s, early 80s. Um, back home here in Canada, just this, um, you know, the CN Tower, which um, just, uh, we're, we're always taken in by tall structures too, right? We love to see something really tall and slender or a big cantilever that's reaching way out there. It's somehow just, it, it's drama. And uh, that happened here in Toronto too. Um, Renault factory in, in London. Um, this was the, the, the coming out of the British high tech, of course, movement. Or you could have called it the European too, but I would say it was led, led by the British. Um, the architects like, you know, Nicholas Grimshaw and Richard Rogers, Norman Foster too and uh, just a mechano set type of structure that was just supposed to be met a metaphoric reference to, uh, to, to what was taking place inside the factory, an automobile factory um, production facility. And uh, I find it very fascinating and very interesting structure expression too. And, uh, and yet we've noticed in the recent years that there's been a little bit of uh, ebbing from this position where you just put the structure all on the outside. And it was also done in the name of efficiency because instead of tucking all the structure underneath the roof membrane, um, it was put outside and then you could actually drop your roof envelope and uh, you have less space to heat, less volume to, uh, to air condition. We did a similar building uh, for EPCO Aerospace and that was one of our first projects in 1989. And uh, I would say yet there's been a bit of a retreat from this sort of, you know, in your face structural expression uh, where you hang it all out on the outside. There's still sometimes purposes for it and reasons and good functional reasons for it, but um, um, nevertheless this is... Uh, Example of the British high-tech movement, if you like. Here, uh, back home again, the BCE building there in Toronto, uh, Santiago Calatrava. Um, just beautiful structural expression. You know, brings it right down to where you can feel it and touch it and see it up close and soaring way up high here. You know, of course, you could get away with a little canopy just over top of these buildings here. But uh, there's just a, a beautiful expression that brings life to this whole atrium when the structure is exposed in that manner. Is it in inexpensive? No, it isn't. And uh, was this inexpensive? Um, there's way less expensive ways to get across here, but uh, <laughs> as you can appreciate. But just another beautiful example of how uh, it just intrigues the, the, the beholder because you're looking at the counterweight here, this big concrete counterweight holding up the, the, the concrete weight out here and in the, in, in the pedestrian and vehicular load. Um, just a, a beautiful expression of um, simple exposed structure. The Malau viaduct, um, these soaring pylons, and then these, you know, harpsichords, they're harps if you like. Uh, you know, over the top there. Um, fabulous examples. The last one I want to show here from the built environment um, is uh, the Beijing Olympic Stadium, uh, National Stadium. Um, much can be said about the stadium, particularly about the, sustainable, the sustainability of it, because the amount of steel that was used here is just like huge. And uh, one of the reasons why the Olympic Oval at that, uh, in, in, in um, 2009, won the Award of Excellence there in London, uh, granted by the Institution of Structural Engineers. Um, was not because it was just also a good display of structural engineering and innovation. This was as well. But in the sustainability category, um, this, this scored very low, to put it mildly. And it's so you, you can discuss from that point of view, but nevertheless, it's, it's just this beautiful expression of, of, of structure. And I remember uh, on one of the last days of the Olympics, um, I think it was an ABC reporter, and she was just commenting on, they, they panned into this view again at night, and they just, uh, she made a remark, you know, you can never really get tired of looking at the Beijing bird's nest, particularly in the evening time when it's all lit up inside. Uh, unfortunately, it's hardly being used at all. 
It's an 80,000 seat stadium. And in terms of sustainability uh, factors, you know, looking at it from the sustainability point of view that way, it's, it's not being used very much. And the Olympic Oval, for instance, is being used all the time. And it was always intended to be used all the time afterwards. So there's those sides. But nevertheless, just as a standalone structural expression, it's something that is, uh, is, uh, can be behold. So what can we learn from the built structure? Um, once again, there's, there's examples of, um, of, of um, covered structure. There's examples of completely exposed structure. It should always have a functional purpose, of course. You know, why are you doing it? And I want to walk through um, some examples of our work right away and give you, uh, particularly point out some of the possibilities and also some of the pitfalls that we've encountered. Um, just real right down at street level, practical reasons when we should and when we shouldn't expose structure. Um, just to frame the uh, discussion going forward, uh, where are we heading now with exposed structure? We looked at history, we looked at nature. Uh, where is it heading now? Well, this slide demonstrates, I think, in part where we're heading now. Uh, we live in the 21st century. And, and I always like to say we live in the most glorious times that architects and engineers can possibly live in. Because A, we have like materials at our disposal which the previous generations never had to work with. And uh, if you look at even timber, steel, concrete, the big three materials, and now we're getting to fiberglass and structural fiberglass and plastics and glass, and there's gonna be other ones added down here too. Um, just take wood alone here. Like you have all these engineered woods now like Paralam and timber strand and Microlam and glue lamb and you have also the plywoods and you have this uh, curto lumber from Finn Forest and just a, a whole, a whole um, um, variety of uh, different types of timber materials with much higher strengths than natural wood. And it doesn't shrink anymore either if it's an engineered wood. There's hardly any shrinkage. And so we're dealing with all this, you know, there's this wonderful palette of materials on the timber side. And of course in steel you can get into stainless and aluminum and castings we'll look at a little bit right away. And concrete we're into pre-stressed and the geelia and ductile and also as a block work and masonry work. So the, the horizons have just been expanded um, you know, many, many times over. And so we live in fabulous times as structural engineers and architects because uh, we can avail ourselves of so many different materials and explore different possibilities. So just to frame going forward uh, the, the, the rest of the discussion, I think in the future um, you're going to see more and more interesting structural expression, particularly using hybrid uh, materials. And by hybrid materials, I say a mix, uh, a hybrid mix of materials. So you're gonna mix steel and wood, you're gonna mix steel and concrete, um, and then just have all sorts of different uh, permutations of uh, material use. Let's look at some projects that we've become involved in. Um, here's, uh, we don't do a whole lot of towers, but here we are called in to do one tower um, that's going to be taking, con constructed next year, sometime, sometime next year, right next to Surrey Library. And there's a new Surrey City Hall and it's called Three Civic Plaza. And in this case here, the architect uh, had a desire to somehow um, create some structural expression as part of the architecture. And uh, how do you do that? Typically the core is right in the middle of the building. And uh, so right from the very beginning, we discussed first principles, and this is gonna be a 26-story hotel building here, and close to 50-story residential <coughs> hotel tower over here. And they're interconnected. And so we talked first principles, and. Uh, and, and one of the things we said too is that from a torsional perspective, we want to get the main shear walls out towards the edge, ed edges of the building, like, like bookends in the building. And uh, so uh, what came out of all that was uh, a, some, some shear walls here on this side of the building as well as on the other side starting right at the very bottom and going up the top. And they're going to be perforated with these openings here. And uh, the openings start small at the bottom and on the other side, unfortunately I don't have a picture of that, but they are very uh, small at the bottom where we have the highest shear loads. And then as we move toward the top of the building, they get larger and larger. And so uh, this is an example of uh, trying to create some architectural expression with exposed structure. Not done very often on towers, but uh, in this case, um, this was the, uh, the um, wish of the architect. And so we worked very closely together with the architects to work out how can this, uh, how can this be best be done without uh, unduly compromising the structural capacity of the building. So that's uh, hopefully gonna be constructed starting next year. Um, here right down at a, a completely different uh, level, this was our former conference room. We've since done renovations. But uh, what we did in this conference room was we had this little, little uh, plexiglass bubble up top here and these little wood slat pieces as arches. And then we had these uh, cables running across here. And what I wanna point out here at a very simple level is uh, in an exposed structure, we're increasingly talking about trying to make the structural elements do double duty and triple duty 
and even quadruple and quintuple duty. Make it do more than just hold up a structure. In this case here, it of course acts as a tension tie for this you know, bowed arch piece up here. Um, but the other thing it does is for, these, uh, for, for the lighting here, it acts as uh, conduits for the lighting, for these low voltage lights. And so uh, it has a double function. Very, at a very simple basic level in a simple conference room, um, that's, uh, that was the purpose of this here, just to try and show that we can double up structure and use it for more than one purpose. And it worked uh, fine, actually acoustically, of course, with a, 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 a bulb shape like this. This is a disaster here. And it was always terribly loud because all the sound is focusing right down in the middle of the room. But uh, we learned our lessons on that front. There's a simple example of um, a double duty structure. Here's a, uh, another example of it. And uh, this is a house by uh, Measured Architects over the west side of Vancouver. And it uh, doesn't show very well there because it's just in a construction still. But what I want to show you here was uh, Here's uh, the floor structure, the second floor structure. Now it's very seldom that you see second floor structures or floor structures exposed from the underside. Roof structures is more common. But in a floor structure, it doesn't happen very often. Normally you've got all sorts of conduit running through here. In this case, this is, uh, um, I think it's about a 16 or 18 foot span across here. And uh, just very thin concrete, like two and a half, three inches thick concrete, which couldn't span the full distance. And so we strengthened it with these uh, yellow cedar wood beams and put what we call an HBV connector in here, a shear connector, that gets poured into the concrete and glued into the wood beam. And uh, the wood can actually stop just shy of the concrete here uh, because the concrete will take the shear, the topping takes the shear and transfers it into this wall here. Here you see board form concrete. Um, structural expression, but doing more than just supporting the, the, the floor loads, it's actually also creating the interior architectural expression. And when this has, of course, got the lighting on it, it's going to be a beautiful, it's going to really create a beautiful environment and bring warmth into the room, um, you know, with these uh, yellow cedar beams up here. So there's something doing uh, double duty. Well, let's uh, move along a bit further to the Van Dusen Gardens, which uh, many of you have probably seen already. Um, what's the lesson to learn in this one here? Um, there's, there was the inspiration. Um, a series of petals here of an orchid coming off a central oculus. And um, there you see once again this sort of central spine that's in a leaf and then these tributary spinelets, if you like to call them that, and some panels in between. And that's not unlike what you see in the final um, expression here of the, uh, in the, the interior expression of the building. But uh, the main point um, here is not, it wasn't so much to try and resemble, you know, what happens in nature in the leaf form. Um, yes, the, ar the organic architectural expression does that, but from a structural perspective, I think the main lesson <coughs> that we can learn here is that uh, you can build very complex forms and still express structure. Um, typically, when you build very complex forms, you often have to either build it with concrete or you have to wash it out with drywall because uh, geometrically it gets so complex trying to get everything in the right place and, and manufacture it to the right location that it simply is often covered up with drywall or with some sort of siding in the bottom. Um, in this case here, or nowadays, of course, we enjoy the luxury of we have 3D uh, analysis programs, we have 3D software that just helps us to uh, build things and design things and analyze things, which we could never do previously. And uh, in this case here, if it hadn't been for software that enables us to actually manufacture or create this, these uh, three-dimensional shop drawings and create very accurate prefabricated panels, uh, it, would have been, it would have been very tempting to want to just cover up the structure in this case here. Uh, but we can, nowadays, of course, we can build very accurately these, these, these glue lamps here. The panels, you can see there's a, a glue lamp on the left side here, on the right side, and, and they're different shapes. And uh, in the end, um, it's constructed by simply having these two flanking glue lamps and then uh, simple um, dimensional lumber in between and skin it with some plywood insulation inside and the slats on the bottom. And uh, there were 70 of these panels constructed all together and uh, they were dropped into site as prefabricated units. And uh, there you see the central oculus and, the, uh, and, and this peel and stick that was put on top uh, as a preliminary uh, membrane during construction. And there you see the final expression with the ribs coming down here and with the uh, slats in between. Um, there you see another example of it there we see the, the emphasis of the ribs here. Um, and it's, it's a case where, uh, you know, we, we have these tools available nowadays and we can just be very, very accurate with what we construct. 
and even the CNC machinery that, for instance, the glue lamp suppliers use. Um, those glue lamp beams, they come out of the shop very accurately formed and cut uh, you know, with respect to bolt holes and in cuts and bird mouse and all that. And so uh, we have, the, we have the, the tools available nowadays to construct very complex organic forms and express a structure. We don't just have to put the structure in place and then cover it up. If you take, for instance, music experience building, well, you can't see some of the, in Seattle, you can see some of that exp structure expressed, but it doesn't form part of the expression, the architectural expression. Um, and even like Bilbao and places like that, they were all constructed with steel. This is probably the first example of such a complex organic form that was uh, constructed with wood and also prefabricated wood elements. So we have, we live in good times because we have these tools at our disposal which enable us to actually construct very intricate and very complex exposed structure. And uh, there once again you see the ribs here and of course the exposed columns, uh, tapered columns here and the, and the joints up here. Uh, a lot of thought went into those too. Um, here another example of a, of a residence again. Um, in this case here, um, it's, it's simply like a coffered ceiling with a two-way uh, glue laminated uh, timber construction. Uh, the architect and the owner particularly who, uh, who grew up in, in Japan, he wanted to have some reference to, uh, to Japanese architecture and so we went through a lot of iterations and just trying to decide, well, what do we really want to see in the roof structure there? And he did want to see some sort of exposed elements and in the end uh, we ended up uh, designing a coffered ceiling here with two directional glue lamps or two-way spanning glue lamps. Um, they come down and what's interesting here when you when you expose a structure like this you sort of can see how the forces run into here and are collected in these longitudinal ones and they run down down the arms here these cantilever steel plates uh, and then down the post here and down into the foundation and there's something intriguing what people find, even the lay people, lay persons find intriguing about seeing exposed structure. And what was most gratifying in this case here, um, here you can see this two-way coffered ceiling, and these are just um, non-structural plywood info panels that conceal the uh, electrical conduits and lighting up above, the, uh, above those panels. Um, there you see it the outside again. Uh, what was really gratifying in this case here was uh, it, it, there were some difficulties in construction. And it often is the case when, you, when you're dealing with exposed structure, but there were some difficulties. And so there was some strain and relationships and that, and then uh, it was all finished and it turned out nice. And uh, one day I got a call, uh, a message when I was on vacation from the owner, and he, um, he left a message and I wasn't sure should I answer this call. And I decided not to answer it until I finished vacation. Because <laughs> I thought, for sure, he's gonna call him and say that, we were always concerned maybe this, this cantilever is gonna be sagging a little bit, and he's gonna get upset about that. And I was sure he was calling, calling up about some complaint. In any event, uh, finally I, 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 I got the courage to you know, take the message off my cell phone and to listen to it. And what he said was very gratifying because he simply said, Paul, you know, I know it's been a difficult time going through construction, but I want to let you know we've had guests over and they sit here in this, in this room here in the living room, the kitchen, the, the dining room, and the patio, and they just remark on how much they appreciate this express structural form. And so um, you, you done right and lit and well lit as, too, um, it, it can be, um, it, it can create beautiful spaces. Um, but if it's not done right, it can also go terribly wrong. Um, the, the oval, which uh, of course um, we've, I'm sure we've all heard about, um, here's a case where we like to say that the structure did quadruple and quintuple or quintuple duty. Um, you notice here that there's no exposed ducts, there's no exposed conduits up here, no exposed sprinkler pipes or sprinkler mains. It's all completely clean structure. And right from the get-go, we did our research in previous ovals that have been constructed over in Europe. Um, we came to the conclusion, let's try and hide all the mechanical insulation because it'll just, it'll just, uh, uh, detract from good architectural expression. And uh, so that was, that was a, a high priority, uh, coming off uh, visiting a number of ovals over there in Europe and uh, Scandinavia, uh, one in um, Lillehammer there and Turin. And so we set about how can we hide that. And so uh, we began with the arch and we said, well, let's create a hollow arch. And this arch here is uh, first going to do the structural work, but we need some extra strength in here as well. So we decided, well, let's put some steel in the bottom here. Um, which could also metaphorically express the speed skating function inside with this sort of sharp blade-like uh, point at the end. 
And then uh, there's some steel on top here to strengthen on top and hold these two Goulam slabs here um, together so they don't just uh, fall apart or you know splay apart. So there's some bracing up in here. But inside, that's where we said we'll put the duct. Interestingly, when I first asked the mechanical engineer, how much space will you need inside the duct? He said, well, I need this much just down there. And that would have been perfect. Then we wouldn't have had to have any um, you know, galvanized metal duct in here. And so then it grew and it grew and it grew. And finally, I asked him, is this still big enough here? <laughs> and he actually said, well, I remember the meeting so well. And he said, well, you know, we can put that duct right there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I said, I won't name his name, but I said, it's going there. That's why these things are designed as hollow arches. Anyway, so there's the ducts. We, we drill some holes into the side of these, uh, the, into these glue lamp slabs here. So there's diffusers in there. They blow the air through there. And uh, tucked up inside here is the sprinkler main, and there's the electrical conduits. And they all get spliced and then branched off into these panels, which uh, we'll show you right away. Um, here's the, um, here's the, uh, the arches being fabricated in the shop. And of course, there's a huge coordination effort if you head in this direction, trying to integrate mechanic, me mechanical installation and structure. And so they actually came into the shop and pre-installed their ducts. And of course, uh, they all have to be spliced in the field because those arches are 300 feet long. So they came out in 80 foot sections. So they had to be, uh, not only the arches have to be spliced here, but the ducts have to be spliced way up there in the air. So it's a, it's a major coordination effort. But uh, in the end, um, um, I'll show you the erected, uh, or the finished structure right away again. Here's the panels, which were constructed with pine beetle two by fours. And in cross section, um, let's just build this up here. And here you have uh, additional functions coming into play. Whoops, I didn't want to go that far. So here you have the, the, the panels. They're a waveform here. I don't know why the other two by fours aren't showing up. But here's the two by fours that are um, um, aligned like this here with some gaps in between. Um, now, by going with this waveform, you've actually increased the acoustic surface area, the available acoustic surface area, about 40%. So going with a waveform not only increases the structural strength of these panels, it increases your acoustic surface. So by laying this black acoustic liner behind you, now you've got great acoustic performance that the structure is supporting. Um, we're also creating a hollow space in here so that the electrical conduits and the sprinkler lines can go get tucked inside here and then just protrude out below here. And so uh, you've got structural performance, you've got acoustic performance, you've got mechanical electrical um, performance happening, if you like, or be, it being supported by the structure. And finally, you have a beautiful aesthetic expression. And so you have all these different functions that structure is doing. And that's the direction that I think exposed structure will increasingly head in, uh, where you're mixing different materials, um, trying to make them serve multifunctional. Um, and so this was uh, probably the best example we could show from our experience so far of, of how that can work. There you see the diffusers. There you see these openings that uh, create the acoustic uh, absorption with the acoustic liner behind. And of course, that increased surface area here. Um, no sprinkler pipes here. Um, they did end up tucking some conduits along the edge here, which you can't actually read from down below. But um, in any event, uh, and just, a, of course, a beautiful aesthetic expression. Um, and uh, been, uh, it, it was just a joy to be a part of this project here and, uh, and see how it actually turned out, notwithstanding all the coordination efforts that took place. There you see the diffusers there. And uh, once again, this whole notion of hybrid, you know, use steel to help the wood span across here. You know, they're both working. The wood's doing the most of the work, but the steel is helping it and also connecting the wood pieces together. So uh, rationale behind everything and uh, to create uh, some beautiful express structure. Here's a project in northern Alberta, um, Athabasca University. Uh, once again, it's, the, the structure is, is serving multiple functions here. In this case, uh, simple glue lamp supported by steel struts. And then uh, these solid wood panels that uh, rest on the Gulam beams. Um, we actually approached Western Archer, the Gulam supplier up in uh, Edmonton, and asked them, well, why if you're going to supply the Gulam, why don't you also supply these solid wood panels? And these are actually 2x4 and 2x6 panels. And so the 2x4 and then 2x6, 2x4, 2x6. So this actually got a riffled ceiling effect. And um, we asked them, can you nail those together and send them to the site? So they did that. And ever since then, They've uh, fallen in love with these prefabricated uh, um, solid wood panels. 
and, and particularly these riffle type of panels, except they said, we're not going to nail those anymore. From now we're going to glue them. So we're basically going to take glue lamp beams and lay them on the side and router out these gaps on the underside and sell that as a product, which they call West Deck. Well, I understand that's a copyright infringement, so they may have to change the name. So don't Google West Deck, Google uh, Western Arch Rib solid wood panels. Um, but uh, so th these solid wood panels uh, were installed here. And um, so what you have here is th the structure is not just uh, performing a structural function, but it's an also an architectural expression, of course. And there's also some acoustic help you're getting here because the dispersion of, uh, of sound because of this riffle ceiling effect. And the other thing we do is we space these panels here in such a way that you've got a gap in between. And there you run your sprinkler lines. You can run your electrical conduits in there. And uh, if all goes as planned, um, you have a very nice structural expression, architectural expression up there. However, um, there you see it from down below through this opening uh, in the floor. Things don't always go as planned. And uh, here you see uh, this sprinkler was supposed to be actually put in a gap up behind here. And it had no place being down here. And one day you show up at a site, and they've already installed it down here. And now you've got a battle royale in your hands because they say, well, you didn't show it in your drawings down there, or it wasn't, we weren't explicitly told to put it there. And this is where you put it. And if you want to have it moved now, it's going to be a big extra. And of course, there's construction schedules to meet. And the, the, the regular, you know, on and on it goes. And now you've got a big fight in your hands. And uh, in this case, uh, we were unsuccessful in getting it moved out um, because the budget, you know, they, there was no more room in the budget to move this here. And so as a result thereof, like we've now instructed our staff that whenever we have exposed structure, if there's sprinklers and sprinkler mains, you sit down right at the very first meeting and explain to everybody, including the plumbing contractor, the plumbing subcontractor, where those pipes are going to go. And uh, in this case here, well, uh, it was partially salvaged by, uh, you could call it a celebration of plumbing, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> they, they painted it all white, the same color as the vertical struts here, the raking struts. And uh, you know, it actually does blend out a little bit, but it didn't have to be that way. And we've encountered that on numerous projects, where these sprinkler mains end up right where you don't want them. And uh, you really have to put your, make it very clear at the outset. And even in the, it, it requires coordination even on the, on the contract drawings just to avoid that type of problem. But all in all, it turned out to be a nice uh, expression. Another um, example of double duty. Um, Greg's here. Greg uh, Johnson, right? <laughs> you remember this one, right? <laughs> and uh, double duty in this case is, um, is uh, the structure is doing its structural work and is also advertising for the client. So uh, we came up with this whimsical idea here. Um, I remember when Russell was in our office, Russell Acton, and it was just a, a very simple addition, office addition, two stories onto this uh, you know, warehouse in the back, this derelict warehouse that's really nondescript. And uh, the company is called Dendal Springs. And so at some point in time, we suggested uh, Russell, why don't we consider um, actually you know, promoting this company right in the structure? And we're going to um, support the stairs inside the lobby here on springs that they manufactured by Dendal Springs. So Russell said, yeah, let's, let's, let's go for it, you know. It was a very whimsical idea. and You may like it, may not like it, but, uh, but it turned out interesting. And it, it was a lot of fun designing. And so here we hung, you know, this landing here from a spring, some tension rods, a spring here, right in the middle, of, you see there. And down here you see some springs also at the landing that have to, uh, that, that support the, um, the stringers. Here you see uh, coming down to the lower landing, these tall springs here. And in this case here, we actually, um, purposefully said we don't want to conform to the code deflection requirements, which are normally like span divided by 360, because if these things don't move at all, it won't be any fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> and so we actually, uh, we actually uh, looked at this very closely. Of course, you have to be very careful here at the threshold, right? You have to put a stiff spring at the, at the threshold so you don't have a trip hazard there, where the height of the riser it suddenly changes. But these ones here, um, th these can go as much as they like. And so, um, and so we tried to make those as bounce as we could. And in the end, I don't know, Greg, were we successful or not? Like, uh, it's a bit bouncy. It's a bit bouncy, but it wasn't bouncy enough. So we were somewhat unsuccessful in our structural endeavor. But, uh, but nevertheless, um, it, was a, it was a fun little exercise. It creaks a lot and it groans a lot. <laughs> and you need a lot of HD40, I think. But, uh, <laughs> but in any event, uh, so there's double duty in a whimsical way. Um, some advertising and also structural support. And I think uh, Greg and Russell and everybody liked it so much that they even put in some springs here for the guardrails. <laughs> and uh, I'll leave it to Greg to rationalize how you can, uh, how you can rationalize uh, 
nobody falling through there. But there is a way. There is a way. So um, here's another example of uh, not our work, but uh, Channel 4 building in London. I don't know if any of you have seen this one. But the message I want to put forward here is you can have very disciplined structural expression, and you can, you can go over the top. And, and with all due respect for the architect that designed this here, um, here I would say this is a beautiful example here, these exposed steel frames with these beautiful hinge connections with stainless steel pins. Um, it, it's just a very good, sensible, logical structural expression there. Um, nowadays, you know, increasingly talk about thermal bridges and that with steel going inside and outside the building. It's becoming less popular, of course, to put the structure through the, through the envelope. But that aside, that's nice there. But when you look at this entry area here, this large glass wall, and uh, you see the amount of cables that were installed, your tension rods, and all this busyness behind here. And you look inside there, and uh, I just find that this is over the top. This is over the top exposed structure where you, you, you're trying to force something, or it's becoming, it's just becoming over the top. And in this case here, I couldn't help but think, you know, a simple horizontal steel tube arch just wrapping right around the corner here, um, maybe at a couple levels, would clean that whole facade up and get away from all this busyness and fussiness. So, um, uh, you know, everybody can have, of course, their, their opinion on, on, on this type of expression, but uh, I think, um, you know, structure, um, exposed structure can be kept more modest, and uh, in this case, I think it went a bit too far, and not to mention very expensive. Um, here's a case of a, uh, a house, a residence. Um, in Beech Grove, I won't give you the exact address, <laughs> but um, this is a case where you have exposed concrete structure, and uh, it was this. This was a feature wall, and it was supposed to be. Uh, and we, we specified a Julia concrete, so we have a high flow concrete and really a high quality finish. Well, the lesson to learn here is, uh, if you're going to expose structure, you have to have the contractor on site. You have to have the sub trays on site. You have to have the concrete formwork sub trade, and then whoever's pouring the concrete. You have to have them on site. Everybody has to play, play along and be very diligent in making sure this doesn't happen. Now, uh, if you're an Englishman, you might like this map of England, you know, <laughs> permanently <laughs> emboss your wall. But if you're another nationality, you may be apt to tell the contractor to rip it out and start all over again, uh, which uh, I think is what happened in this case here. But uh, that's just a reminder that if you're, if, if you're going to design exposed structure, everybody has to be on site and everybody has to be paying attention and you need high quality construction because it's all there on display. Here are some examples of, uh, um, of uh, when, when you have exposed wood construction, timber construction, and uh, they don't, spe we always specify galvanized bolts, galvanized metal for all um, structure that would be exposed to the elements even during construction. And so in this case, when you're using black bolts, the water comes on here, it just leaves a mess behind and you can be sanding there for a long time before you get those black stains out. So um, when you're using express timber construction or exposed timber construction, um, keeping it covered up, or you can't use black bolts. It, it, you you want to use galvanized bolts uh, unless you take other measures to keep it uh, dry through the entire period of construction. Here also, um, just uh, glue lamp beams typically come out in this breathable wrap. And here was a school that uh, um, it just somehow all went sideways and you ended up with this terrible staining here and then and, and the sanding that took place there. And here's a classic case. If the wrap comes off you're in construction and then you just take poly and try and cover it up with poly, which can't breathe. And now you're trapping condensation and moisture inside there. You've got a recipe for a really uh, accelerator rot on your hands and, uh, and, and mildew to start developing. And before you know it, you're sanding, you're sanding, you're fixing up your wood. So these are just things that you want to be aware of if you're dealing with exposed timber construction. Um, um, it doesn't have to be like that. Just the, the amount of sanding that had to take place here just to clean up these glue lamps was, uh, was huge. Um, so there's that, uh, an example of that. Here, um, Richmond Christian School. Um, this uh, beautiful um, north-facing facade glass from about eight feet on right up the roof. Uh, but what I want to show you here is uh, what do you think is missing in this building? Like there's, that, uh, there's a classic sprinkler line there, by the way. Got dropped right down in there. We're supposed to go right up in there. But these are simple glue lamps. MDF uh, ceiling, uh, ceiling boards up here. 
simple two by 12 structure spanning between the, between the glue lamps. But you notice there are no mechanical ducts in here. And here's just a little uh, tip to uh, particularly the architects in the room that uh, push your mechanical engineer when it comes to mechanical ducts and, and the requirements for gymnasium structures. And right away I'll show you the arena too. In this case, they're all, there's a big distribution duct right here on the mezzanine floor. You see it just the outline of it right there. There's the diffusers and they blow the air in from the side. And this is a, about an 80 foot span by 120 foot long, a secondary school size gym. And there's no mechanical ducts that are required here. You go into most gymnasiums, always got ducts in there. You always want to ask your mechanical engineer, do I really need those ducts or can I just blow it in from the side here? And uh, I'm not a mechanical engineer, so I'm not an expert in that, but, uh, but uh, we ask that question and we pose that question and put it in the room too to make absolutely sure, are they required and do we really have to conceal them? Because to have big ducts coming through here next to all these blue lamps, which is often the case, is just um, not the most sightly um, expression. So uh, here, pair, is, pair of palms here today too, and uh, credit to him. Um, um, he gave us and the architectural team this commission here to design Trout Lake Arena. And yes, there is some exposed wood here, and it has to be uh, treated properly and, and, and the correct sealant uh, applied to that. And uh, you can get a good number of years out of that then. But what I want to show you inside is there was also a desire here to have some timber, uh, exposed timber inside the building. And the architect had a desire to have a, a clear story light here, right down the middle of the rink. The blue line is actually, the center line is actually right here. So the length of the rink is actually left to right. Uh, it's just the lens that's being used that creates this distorted view. And so uh, there's this uh, steel truss that goes across here and these glue lamp beams that pitch down here and off the upper cord pitch down the other way and some metal decking up top here. But once again in this building, where is the ducts? There's no mechanical ducts. And the air is blown in from one end over here and pulled out the other end. And uh, Per was telling me beforehand there's just one inch, one inch of insulation in this roof here. Apparently it wasn't the three inches required, correct? And so um, you don't have to worry about the ducts in this, in this instance. So, um, so uh, it's just good to ask that question. Do you really need the mechanical ducts? Is there some other way around it? Can we conceal them somehow, you know, in an incon inconspicuous way? Um, and so uh, we, we find there's a varying levels of re resolve when it comes to those type of challenges in the architectural community. And it all depends what architect you're working with. Um, there's one other arena we're doing right now and the duct is going to end up right there above the seating area and uh, we, we thought there were solutions to get rid of it, but um, it just a little bit lacking in resolve. Uh, so that's, uh, that's on the, when it comes to ducts in, uh, in these exposed structural uh, spaces. Um, Hillcrest Recreation Center, the lesson to learn here, what I find is that we weren't the engineers and this is Reed Jones Christofferson and HCMA architects. <coughs> what I love about this pool here is lots of wood, wood decking over top, there's uh, the, the steel support structure here, these steel columns, elliptical shapes, um, and then this round tube going along the top here. Very nice expression, but um, what often happens when it comes to exposed structure is if you have too much of one material, it becomes overwhelming or it becomes somewhat monotone. And to have some accent here and there is a great thing. And the way it was done in this case here is, here you have these uh, acoustic panels, which uh, are required. And so they're just extended along here for a certain uh, distance. To, uh, to provide enough ac acoustic absorption. And then over here we have the mechanical ducts. There's a different colored panel. I don't know if, I don't think it was an acoustic panel here. That just creates also some, some accent. So you have these white panels and the blue panels and some wood exposed over here. And it's a very, very nice balance in this, in, in this swimming pool. Just, just to, to create a very nice ambiance and just a very nice expression. And uh, I, I find it was uh, very, very well done. Here you see it from a different view and even these panels where the ducts come up, they're, they're drawn right down here in the wall. And so here you see lots of timber, you get this accent in here. So too much wood expression or too much uh, metal deck, particularly steel metal deck expression, uh, it, 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 can, it, can, it can diminish the, uh, I think, the uh, beauty of the space. Uh, but uh, judiciously and strategically locating uh, acoustic panels and, 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 and coverings here for your mechanical ducts can really, I think, add a beautiful accent to the space. So um, one of the last ones I want to show you here is that we're working with Bjarke Engels Group on an arena in Sweden right now. And this is another case where uh, um, they're actually uh, digging this arena right out of the, uh, they're going to excavate down deep here and, and dig it out of this, um, it's a very gravelly area here, and uh, dig a hole in here, 
drop the arena and the, and, and the ice surface down here at a lower, lower level, and then uh, have a, a, a curved roof going over top here. And uh, this is all accessible, so people can walk up here and run up here. And of course, it snows on there, and significant amounts of snow. And the question was, well, how to construct this roof here? And originally, they actually had um, a consultant from England, and uh, they recommended that we, they look at a one meter thick concrete slab um, to, to, to cover that entire space. And of course, that just sent the budget into orbit. And then they came to us and said, is there any way you could do this with wood? Well, on one hand, you're going to go to something that is the weakest material on the block and away from the, one of the strongest materials, concrete. So how are we going to get that done? But on the other hand, by taking a meter of concrete out of there, the, the, the savings in weight is just like huge, right? You're saving a lot of weight there, even though you're putting a green roof on top of there and have high snow loads, plus, of course, the, 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 the occupancy load on top, which has to be 100 pounds a square foot for a public uh, you know, access like that. And so we came up with it. We began to discuss with them, well, how can we do this? And of course, the arch form is the most effective structurally, it's a very structurally efficient form. And so we thought, well, you know, instead of just going pure glue lamp here, the architect wanted to have this double curvature in these glue lamps, and, and you don't have a pure parabolic ar arch form when you do that. There's huge bending stresses in there with all that earth in the roof and the snow loads, et cetera, et cetera. And they wanted this flap out in the back here too, which, um, which uh, is a separate uh, challenge. And so we, <laughs> <laughs> so we decided, uh, well, why don't we introduce some steel arches in here like this that can also serve as a mechanical ducts if they're going to be required. <laughs> and uh, two of them like this here. And then we can still double, curv double curvature these, uh, these, 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 wood, uh, these wood beams here. And we'll have these protruding down below here. And uh, that was uh, the direction things were going in. And what was going to happen here was we're going to have this, these drywall infill panels between these wood beams that stick out just in the bottom. So there's a beautiful architectural effect when you have this drywall infill panel. Um, uh, particularly, I think, when it's painted out white, too, and, uh, and, and just the wood, these, these, these uh, you know, curvy wood lines just sweeping across the arena. And uh, so we talked, uh, and then Bjarke came to town, what, it was a year ago, I think, now, and uh, we had a meeting with him uh, to talk about it. And we actually decided to uh, flip directions because um, we wanted to, um, those, those protruding arches were not so desirable. And so we decided, well, why don't we flip the direction of these blue lamp beams, and we're going to stick the arches in here as pure arches, and... Uh, and we're going to create this uh, curvature in this, uh, in this direction here. And we're going to actually have two big wide flange beams at each one of these locations here. And they're going to touch each other. The, the, the flanges are going to touch each other. They're going to form a box where we can run all our services and that up inside there. And the glue lamps are going to actually protrude below these steel boxes. And so you're actually going to not see any steel boxes in there whatsoever. It's just going to be the glue lamp beam sweeping front to back. And, uh, whoops. And, um, and uh, we're going to cover, you won't, these will just disappear here, these steel arches. And so that's going to be the effect here, similar to what you see um, actually in here with this uh, drywall infill panels. So the point here being that, uh, you know, we could make it all wood, we could put wood decking on top here and it'd be all wood, but that drywall in between, I think, creates a very interesting architectural effect. And that's what uh, they want to do there, what uh, Bjarke wants to do in this case. So um, that's what's hopefully going to get constructed uh, um, well, we're hoping the next year or so. Um, some SkyTrain panels here um, on the Canada line. Um, what I'd like to show you here is, once again, wood only can be relentless and, and, and somewhat monotone and overbearing. And so here we came up with these prefabricated um, eight foot by about 40 foot panels. And they consist of steel channels at both edges and then wood infill framing in between, structural wood infill fr framing in between here. And uh, the final expression, of course, is uh, you don't just have wood here, but you have these uh, steel, these white steel accents here. And uh, it, just, it just takes some of the, um, it takes some of the uh, monotone expression out of the wood and just gives that uh, right amount of accent. And with the right lighting here, of course, um, it, just, it just becomes a very um, beautiful, simple architectural expression. And that's another important thing. Uh, what we've found is that um, we've been involved in a lot of timber structures, as you know, and we're often mixing it with steel or with concrete. Um, if the lighting isn't done correctly to bring out the value of the wood and the warmth of the wood, then you're, you're not taking full advantage of the beautiful, natural expression of wood. So lighting is so important, and uplighting to draw out the warmth of wood is just a fantastic thing. 
Um, I don't know if we got time here. How much time we got here still, Leslie? Should we? Got a few more minutes? Okay. Um, here's one that uh, Dubai World Trade Center. Um, <laughs> we didn't think this was uh, like a relentless wood design, but this is about a kilometer long here. And it was going to be an undulating roof. And we proposed with uh, Peter Busby and his team there to have this lattice type of structure here um, that was going to be supported on these lattice columns. And, uh, and uh, we thought this is going to be, they're going to like this over in Dubai. Uh, there's not a whole lot of wood construction over there. And um, so this was the design direction we decided to go in. So the day came, we had to present over in Dubai. And uh, I remember it well because we were all in this big conference room. And the project manager was from Britain, but he was originally from South Africa. And that's important to know because um, then uh, we presented the project. And the, and the Sheikh's daughter was there too in the room. And there must have been 25 people in the room. And uh, so we presented. And then I presented the structure and the direction we're going in, or we proposed to go in. And uh, after I sit down, then Peter Busby looks at the project manager there. Um, and he says, well, what do you think? Um, what do you think about the design? And he just sort of uh, hummed and hawed. He says, you know what? When I grew up in South Africa, we grew up in, uh, in homes and we had these, these, these pine ceilings, you know, wood pine ceilings over our head. And you know, we just, we, we ripped them out after a while. We didn't want to see them anymore. It's too much wood. And so they wanted to get rid of them. So he says, I don't know why we have to go wood here. You know, why is there so much wood here? Uh -huh. And so that wasn't a very encouraging news. And uh, <laughs> then he looked out at the, the end of the table, of course, the Sheikh's daughter has a bit more say than he does. And I think she studied architecture in this case, too. And uh, what do you think um, of this here? And she just says, you know what? I actually like it. <laughs> <laughs> so he had two different opinions in the room. But what drove the project manager's opinion was this: that, that, that he grew up in an environment where it was relentlessly wood, right? And too much wood. And so this is the point here. Uh, we were, and in the end, we were actually going to put some steel, because we had some really high stresses locally around here, too. Uh, we were going to put some steel framing right over this part here and then morph it and meld it into this lattice wood structure. And uh, so it would have been quite as relentless as you maybe thought it might be here. In any event, uh, two weeks later, um, the team got notified that everybody was fired. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I don't think it was because of this. I think there were some other issues that were taking place, which I uh, was much, much, much higher weight class than I'm, I operate at. But um, in any event, that was an amusing little experience. Here, uh, I want to point out to you what can happen in, um, in um, the eastern countries. It used to be the wild, wild west, but uh, we should now start referring to it as the wild, wild east because what happens in eastern Europe and further over can be quite different than how we organize things over here. Um, here's a bridge we uh, just finished uh, designing. Actually, I should say that uh, Leonard Andre, a very prominent uh, firm out of Stuttgart, Germany, they did the concept design here. And then the, uh, the, the wood manufacturer um, who was brought in to, uh, to construct this here, prefabricate all the wood pieces, um, he, he retained us to do all the engineering. So we modeled the entire bridge again and, and, and looked at all this. This is a 500 meter long bridge, about half a kilometer long. And it's located in uh, Tbilisi, Georgia. And it connects a resort with some beaches on the other side. And it's a pedestrian bridge about six meters wide. And the express desire of the uh, government at that time, as well as the contractor, was they wanted to build it with wood. And this was under direct uh, supervision of the uh, former, um, was it president or prime minister, uh, Shashkavili, who I think he just got replaced now by some billionaire. And um, so um, this, this went ahead full steam, and we're doing the engineering. This is just one big giant space truss here. And uh, there you see the six meter wide platform width. And um, there you see the exposed structure, or the, the structure, and the, the contractor who specialized in, in chestnut wood manufacture. He had, right from the get go, we decided we're going to cover this up. We're going to put some more, um, you know, some, some secondary slats here on the side and put chestnut wood, complete chestnut siding. So this structure here, all the wood wouldn't be exposed to all the winds that are whipping off the, off the sea there. Um, and, uh, you know, which would eventually gather here in these joints and that. So we just assumed that it's going to be covered up. Well, um, the, the bridge uh, was constructed. And um, in the end, uh, that's not the final bridge. Uh, the bridge was constructed in this form here, 500 meters long. And uh, everything was OK. And then one day, they called us up and said, well, we don't want to cover this up anymore because they sort of liked the appearance of this, you know, rather robust wood. We said, well, you can't do that. We're going to have to recheck the whole design, and you're going to have a maintenance problem. 
and uh, you're going to get water in here and salt water in here and you're going to have some issues. In any event, uh, they, they, were, they were quite intense. So the lesson here to learn is whatever you do, don't flippantly send over to Eastern Europe some sort of solution that you think might be good because if it doesn't get followed through on properly, it'll turn out disaster. Well, at some point in time, I suggested, why don't they cover this up with polycarbonate panels, put some lighting inside, and this could really glow. You know, you see the wood glow through the polycarbonate panels. Well, um, I guess that sort of got filtered through to whoever down there, and uh, they ended up doing it, but albeit they took little eight millimeter thick polycarbonate, <laughs> which is like putting wallpaper on there, and they scabbed it on here, and apparently it looks terrible. And so this is the final result of exposed structure. So you have to have all the players on site, and uh, you're operating you know, in a different environment when you're operating over in Tbilisi, Georgia. <laughs> and uh, it's just different. And just for, if, if nothing else, for, for some amusement. You see this here? This isn't the actual bridge. But uh, what happened uh, is this was, uh, the bridge was supposed to be constructed a year ago last August or September. But they wanted to have a good portion of it up already. And all this product was coming from Germany. Um, they wanted to have it up by August, September, because the president was going to come and open the hunting club there. And so he said, I want to see some bridge up there uh, so I can show everybody. And so um, it wasn't going to be ready in time. And just the first pieces were arriving end of August, early September. And so um, what this contractor did was he specializes in wood manufacture. He constructed a temporary 500 meter long bridge <laughs> for the occasion. And you can see it sagging through here, right? Like, I don't know, I don't think you think I would have walked in there. You see the cable sagging? They're just up here for show. <laughs> and this big steel pylon is there to you, of course, you know, just, just everything's hung up there. And it was all just for a short event to open up the hunting club so the president could see. Well, the hunting club got opened up and, uh, you know, they did walk across here. There you see some people walking across. But um, then right after, the, uh, the, after this occasion, they decided to, they, they were going to take down the bridge right away. They began to dismantle the bridge. Well, they got about halfway, and a big windstorm came overnight and took care of the rest of the problem and just threw it, <laughs> threw it right in the ocean. So uh, when, you're, when you're operating, when you're designing an exposed structure in the eastern block there, um, there's still some more issues to deal with than we may deal with over here. And uh, just a final couple of uh, final buildings here, which are some of my favorites. Here, this Kingsway Bridge. Um, um, this could have easily just been a simple steel arch. Uh, Peter Busby's vision was, let's just create, we don't want any sort of cable. They wanted a signature bridge, the city of Burnaby. And uh, so Peter Busby, he said, let's just create a, a, a nice modest expression, a simple arch. And so um, then the question was, well, how should we construct that arch? Was it going to be a covered bridge? So we put uh, concrete, um, pre-stressed concrete planks down here. Actually, they're post-tension concrete planks. And we have this arch structure here. That could have simply been some steel tubes going across there. No problem, would have been easy to analyze. But we want to introduce some wood here for a couple of reasons. First, you know, from a sustainability perspective, it's a good thing to do, but also just to create some architectural interest. It's just purely about creating some aesthetic interest in this bridge, rather than just two steel pipes coming across here. Um, let's put some wood in here. Originally, we replaced the two steel pipes with some big wood beams here on either side, the left and right hand side, and would have had something spanning in between here. And in the end, we suggested, well, why not take those big ribs and just turn them into six smaller ribs and just create this interesting expression here that's splayed apart down here. And then where the structure is exposed to rain um, at the ends here, we're going to put these hollow tapered steel box sections. And then we have this thin steel plate going over top to keep it all covered. And uh, that was what took place there. Uh, it was a very difficult analysis, and, and from erection construction point of view, it was also difficult, but Dominion Construction built this, and this, this portion here they prefabricated in the parking lot right next to the Sears building here on site, and then lifted it into place. And it all turned out wonderful. The carpenters put their heart and their soul into this project. They did a, they did a fabulous job. And, and you could just see the pride that they were working with, something different, something unusual, and they put every ounce of energy and interest in this, in this uh, structure. And the final architectural structural expression is, uh, is just a beautiful one. And, and just with the right lighting again, um, it's one of those things that, uh, it, it's one of my favorites. Um, it was a difficult birth, but uh, it was, uh, it was uh, one of my favorites. Another one here, uh, the lesson to learn here, this is already 10 years old now. Still looks like, I like to say, like a million bucks 10 years later, like brand new. Um, and the key here was, 
um, Peter and his team, they want, to, they want this to be like an inverted canoe, albeit with a slot down the middle of the canoe. <laughs> and uh, so you got rain coming down here. So it's a leaky canoe. <laughs> and so what do you do here? And we want wood in here. So you could extend the wood out to here, you got a maintenance problem, with rot and all that type of stuff. So what we decided was, well, let's put steel out here as an extension of these little arches coming down here. And here down at the base, where you got this sharp curvature too, we'd have to lay this up with uh, very thin laminations. If you carry the wood all the way through, we decided let's put a steel haunch down here. And um, also from a vandal proof point of view, Alan Hart, who is the project director for the entire line, he said, we don't want vandals carving their initials on any wood down here. So let's also say wood only above a certain elevation here. So you have a hybrid steel, wood, steel, and uh, in between this is a simple solid two by four nailed up roof and uh, stained a little bit, and, um, and, and the final expression is, is, is beautiful. It still looks like, like new today. And the interior part here, of course, there's no wood that's going to rot on you and have maintenance issues. In fact, I think they've already repainted the steel here, uh, but the wood is, uh, the wood is as, as, as per original and as new. So the lesson to learn is, I, I, we're really loath in our practice to recommend ever exposing wood to the elements. It does happen sometimes, the time place for it, but, um, uh, our, our preference, our strong preference is try and avoid that because rotted wood or stained wood or, or, or poorly um, discolored wood is bad advertisement for wood. Um, so there you see the uh, Brentwood Station. Here's Arena Stage um, and what I want to show here is here's an example of a cantilever. Um, it could be expressed raw pure structure. Does it look better with a ceiling finish on it, I would say absolutely yes. It's just pristine and smooth and hanging out there. As much as structure engineers, we like to see our structure expressed there. But uh, that was originally a 180 foot cantilever wagging out there. And uh, then we had some budget issues. There were some cables that were raking back here originally, anchored back to the main roof structure. And so then we extended this concrete wall a little bit further to cut down that span and save a bit of steel. But uh, it's just a beautiful expression, this big cantilever here. But in this case, not exposed. It's covered up. But the other thing that is exposed here is this facade structure and uh, these large parallel columns up to 60 feet high and uh, uh, two and a half feet, so 750 millimeters in cross section, elliptically shaped. Um, but the, and also these muntins that are uh, also um, um, you know, elliptically shaped. Uh, what I want to show you though is particularly the architects. There is what you have is a possibility in terms of shaping possibilities if you go to steel castings. You know, try making something, something like this up with welded steel or bolted steel, it's impossible, right? But if you do have repeat connections, it opens up the door for economic efficiency if you go with a steel casting. And once you decide to go to steel casting, now the sky's the limit and you can, you can form that thing and mold that thing um, you know, to your heart's content. You just have to follow structural principles, of course. But uh, here the load comes down here. And of course these pieces they want to splay apart and you got this piece that holds it together up here like this. That, um, that connection there takes, was load tested at 400,000 pounds. Um, but it's just, it, in my view, this is, uh, this is my favorite connection. This is just a, a thing of pure beauty. Uh, but that's the opportunity we afford ourselves when we consider casting technology. It was done many, many years ago in Britain, of course. You know, the castings were, were par for the course you know, a century ago, and somehow we got away from that. And yet in architecture, I think we can, uh, we can revisit that. And there's a beautiful example of what you can do if you uh, head in that direction. So um, here, I better skip over here quickly. This is this library in, in, uh, in, uh, in Edmonton, um, curvy concrete roof. Um, the question was, well, what's the most efficient form? The, the architect uh, presented us with three different models. And right away, we gravitated towards this one here because just by virtue of its form, this sort of folded plate shape, we said you can clear span the entire library. And so uh, that's what we did. And it's just uh, going through the finishing touches of construction now. And you have these concrete um, waves here that span front to back on these very light steel columns. And all the concrete is exposed up here. Um, one lesson here to learn from this type of structure, this is a boreal center here in Edmonton. Um, and what I want to suggest here is there's a time and place to go with many small pieces of structure as opposed to one heavy piece. 
This case here, you could go one truss element, like one compression cord here, say like it would have been maybe about an eight by 12 uh, timber down here and going up here like this, and then perhaps a couple of six by six struts down here and one big cable underneath like that. But there's something beautiful about um, filigrane structural expression. And in this case, we decided let's just take simple two by tens, space them apart, interlock them with the two by tens coming down from the other side, and interlock them with these little two by four struts coming off of this, off of this uh, you know, bearing, uh, uh, bearing surface here, um, and, and just put some light wires in here. Uh, I think these were 10 millimeter diameter wires and multiple wires and create a completely different aesthetic as opposed to just the singular planar truss element. And uh, the final result is really very beautiful because there you see it, these two by fours and there's the two by tens there and just all interlocked here. And that was a piece of Brazilian hardwood right there, Ipe. So that when we ran the wires underneath there, we didn't have to put any other reinforcing metal in that, in that, in that reveal there. And so, um, and so you have this uh, beautiful structure expression, very light, and dainty, if you like, and that was supposed to be uh, metaphorically what the architect wanted—a a bit of a representation of the bird research that takes place there. So, uh, repetitious, small element structure can be uh, equally nice, if not sometimes nicer, than just um, than, than a singular planar structure. And uh, that bird is uh, did not migrate into that room. <laughs> it's. Uh, Therefore, and here uh, Samuel Brickhouse Elementary School, same type of uh, thing here, a, a, curvy, a curvy wood roof, undulating wood roof, solid wood uh, two by four construction going left to right across here from 16 foot span up to 30 foot span at the wide part, a long foyer, three, 400 feet long, um, very light cables, rep rep repetitious structure here, little castings in here also, lots of structure so you could, it's worth it to make a mold and, and use cast pieces. And these are also cast pieces up in here and uh, just a very light, delicate expression that uh, is, um, is, is nice to behold. So this is a closer here. Um, this is particularly for the architecture students. Um, so um, I think in second or third year architecture, you have to do a project, right? And, uh, and, and uh, ideally, if you can build something, I'm not quite sure what the rules are or the, guide, the guidelines are, but uh, um, what happened here was that my son, who graduated from architecture, who's here in the front too, he, um, four, three years, four years ago now when he graduated, right? Um, he had to do one of these projects as well. And, um, and uh, came up with this design here. And of course he brought it to his structural engineering father and said, well, is this gonna work structurally here? And uh, the problem is, and the one rule of thumb that you always have to, not rule of thumb, it's a rule of structural engineering principles, is for lateral loading, like wind loading, earthquake loading, you typically have to have bracing or shear walls on three sides of your building. In this case, we had one there was one plan on the back side, on the far side here, and the back side in behind there too. And just a very short one here, which was not gonna give us much stiffness. These are just like cedar boards here, two by six tongue and groove cedar boards. And this was gonna be, the rest of it was gonna be polycarbonate panels, which are actually, um, which are actually meant to open up like this, so you can create a, an open space here if you're not using it as a sauna. So um, what to do about this? Um, we're talking about structure doing double and triple and quadruple duty. Well, in this case, uh, we could have put a big steel cross brace in here. And uh, that, uh, the architect that uh, was responsible for this, the architectural student didn't like that. <laughs> and uh, so the next best thing was to just use firewood. And so uh, we thought, well, let's put these logs up here. Actually, when we put the sod, this has got a green roof on it. When we put the sod up in there, um, you, you could just feel this thing moving. Like it, was, it was really quite wonky. And, uh, and that was one of my jobs to also help uh, drag the sod up here. <laughs> and so uh, in any event, it, it was wonky. We knew it was a problem, but you know, Junior said no braces in here. Don't want to see any braces. And of course, uh, Dad had to comply. And of course, uh, I don't think the architecture school funds this type of project. So he, you know, he comes to the bank of Dad for that too. <laughs> in any event, we put these uh, logs up in here and uh, that completely stiffened up the structure. So. The logs are used for firewood, and the logs are used to brace the building. I don't know if that's ever happened before in any building. And of course, the natural question that comes up is, uh, well, what happens when all the logs get used up and you lose your structural stability? And my response to that has typically been, well, if there's no logs to use, 
then there's no fire going to be burning inside here, which means there won't be any people in here. So if the earthquake hits at that time, let it fall over, and we'll just pull it back up again and set it up on its uh, uh, supports, and we'll move on. Anyways, a bit of a whimsical example of exposed structure using firewood to stabilize a building. But uh, suffice it to say um, that um, there's, there's all sorts of directions that it can go in. Hopefully, you've got a little bit of a taste today for some of the possibilities, as well as uh, some of the pitfalls and some of the dangers. And uh, thanks for listening. It's been a joy, and uh, thanks for the invitation.